I want to uh, begin uh, bef- by admitting that I was wrong about something. I know that's hard to believe. But um, it, it was, I guess, four or five months ago, obviously uh, before all of this, and I believe it was in a, uh, maybe one of our Sunday afternoon sessions where we were listing off prayer requests. And uh, Brian Haley, I believe it was, um, mentioned the, the uh, growing news of this pandemic and praying for those who had been affected by it. And he made some comment, I wish I could remember exactly what he said, about how, you know, uh, it's coming for all of us is uh, kind of the idea of what Brian said. And uh, my apologies, Brian, but in the moment I got thought, well, that's a little bit extreme, that th- this is not going to be that big a deal, surely, right? Um, a- around that same time, Jordan Mitchell, who is actually a medical doctor, um, so no, again, no offense, Brian, but uh, Jordan, in a Wednesday, Wednesday night invitation, uh, said something like, it's only a matter of time before this affects all of us. Um, and uh, may- that might have been the phrase Brian used, I don't remember, but... Either way, again, I thought, man, that seems strong to say that each and every one of our lives will somehow be affected by this uh, coronavirus. Um, And yet here we are, right, in July. And uh, it is not an understatement at all to say that every one of us, our lives have been affected in some way by what has happened. And uh, what's also the case in this odd year of 2020 is that this, uh, this virus, the pandemic, has uh, either been the kindling for or uh, has have been happening uh, coincidental to a growing sense of uh, uh, unrest or at least divisiveness in our country. And so it has been, I think we would say for all of us, a trying time. And uh, I say that acknowledging that the nature and the severity of the difficulties have been different for each and every one of us. It could be that, that uh, you um, that are engaged in the worship this morning have had or do have currently some very particular hardship. A health crisis, a financial crisis, something in your family that is going on that is very difficult. And you're dealing with that or have been dealing with that. Um, but if not a specific hardship, I think it is also likely that, that, that we are perhaps just feeling a general anxiety with what is going on. Maybe that's related to the loneliness we're feeling, the isolation that we're experiencing, the uncertainty regarding the future. And if you're just that person that's everything's fine, uh, nothing has been wrong over the last several months, surely you're tired of being cooped up and you're frustrated that you just want things to go back to normal as they've been. Again, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that this uh, particular year, these last few months, have uh, weighed on us, they have challenged us, they have stretched us in some way. One of the uh, very common things that gets asked, or that we might think during a time like this, is, is what is God's will in all of this? What is he up to? What is he wanting uh, to be accomplished through all of these events? Well, uh, I think there's a a few different ways we could uh, ask that or answer that. I think usually the sense that that is meant when we ask a question like this is kind of like, uh, you know, the big picture. God's got some cosmic blueprint of the things that he's trying to work out. And, and you know, maybe we can read the tea leaves or read the signs just right. We can know what God is up to. Uh, and if you read the Bible, uh, uh, you understand that, that that's unknown to us. There is no way for us to know what God's will is in that big picture sense, that all these national or world events, uh, we know he's in control. We know that uh, he's um, not inactive and not indifferent, but uh, we have not been told what his will is in that sense. But personally, and maybe that's the way you say, what's God's will for me in in these events or in this time? I think I can, uh, not presumptuously even, I think I can tell you exactly what God's will is for you and what it is for me. In fact, notice these three passages and the phrase that is used in each one of them in our New Testaments. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says to the Christians, you know, it's not a mystery, You know what instructions, 
we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, Paul says, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Paul says God's will is that, that we would be holy, that we would be sanctified. That means to be more set apart, not just uh, being more pure and not conformed to the world, but set apart for God's service. Sanctification, that's what Paul says is God's will for us. In the next chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says again, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What is God's will for me in this very unique circumstance? Well, Paul says in all circumstances, God's will for you is the same, that you would be joyful and prayerful and thankful to him in Christ Jesus. And finally, uh, in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, um, writing to a group of Christians that are experiencing or are about to experience some hardships, uh, specifically persecution, Peter says in chapter 2, This is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Um, I, I hope that you see the point here. That we ask, well, what is God's will in all of this? It's so difficult, it's confusing, it's uncertain. And it is, I, I, I grant that. But God's will now and at all times is that we would be the kind of people that he wants us to be. His will for us is that we would be holy and joyful and prayerful and thankful and doing of good all the time. Even when things are difficult. Again, 1 Peter was written to people experiencing hardship. And again, you'll notice that phrase in 1 Thessalonians 5. In all circumstances, including difficult ones. And so I will contend uh, this morning, suggest to you that in this trying time, uh, God's will is that we would be his people and that we would be made better. And that we can be made better uh, uh, in spite of the difficulty. But I'll go a step further and say that it could be that if we allow it to and allow him to work, the trying, the trial, will actually, can actually serve to accomplish this very purpose, to make us better, again, if we will allow it. This seems to be one of the main points that James wants to make in his short letter. And I'll ask you to turn there, because that is where we're going to focus the, the, our attention and the rest of our time that we have together in James chapter 1. There's an opening section here, the first 12 verses of James chapter 1, that I want us to read and meditate on, but we'll be bringing in some other verses from the book of James as well, and I think, again, you will benefit from following along. As has always already been said, we are appreciative that you have made the effort to join us. Um, we hope and, and assume uh, we don't know, like normally we can look out and see who's here, uh, but we assume that, that not only do we have our regular congregation assembled virtually in their homes, but that we may also have, as Steve mentioned, people that are not uh, associated with this congregation, that are watching this, that are engaging in the worship. We're so thankful for that and uh, would encourage you to reach out to us if uh, there's anything that, that you would like to know, you'd like to study, or uh, would like to talk to us about or have us pray for you about, uh, please reach out in some way. And again, we appreciate the effort you've made to prioritize the things of God uh, during this time. James chapter 1, let's go ahead and read the first 12 verses of this letter. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. 
For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. One of the uh, characteristics of this passage that stands out is the, uh, the juxtaposition of trials and joy. And that may seem strange to us because we think in hard times, how can I be happy? And of course, it is worth pointing out, as we sometimes do, that when the Bible talks about joy, it is not referring to a superficial happiness where everything is just uh, peaches and cream and uh, we're just giddy and giggling all the time. But joy refers to a, a deep uh, blessedness, a fullness, a contentment that is, uh, that, that is so deep within us that, that regardless of what is going on around us, we can hold on to and be anchored uh, by that joy. But even still, I think we would say that uh, in the midst of hardships, when things are uncertain, when we are tested and tried, uh, it's, it's hard to have contentment. It's hard to, to find, to reach down deep for that blessedness, that joy. And yet, James puts these two things together, and in fact, he actually says that one can lead to the other. He says that we can, in verse 2, count it all joy when we encounter various trials. What in the world is James talking about, and how can that be? Well, you notice in verse 3 that he actually begins to connect these dots. And the first link that he puts in the chain is that we can count it all joy in our various trials. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. This idea of, of, of testing, it's, it's a little bit of a, a difficult word. It can be used in other places it is used to refer to uh, something that we might call temptation. But I think in this context, James is talking about these trials testing us in the same way maybe that Peter uses the illustration in 1 Peter chapter 1 of precious metal being uh, put to the fire, right, to test it and to purify it. And so James says that, that these trials, they are the testing of our faith. We are being stretched. We are being pushed. Uh, we are being beaten, uh, so to speak. And it's going to make us have more endurance. It's going to make us tougher. Uh, it, it, going through hard things, we, we know this in any kind of uh, uh, context. When you go through something hard, it makes you more resilient uh, for the next time. And that seems to be what James is saying. But it's not just that we would become tougher, that the going through hard things would, would, would harden us and make us uh, 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 tough in that way. But in the next verse, he says that endurance, verse 4, has a result. Endurance has an intended goal. And that intended goal is to make us perfect, he says. That is the perfect result of endurance, that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I think James is talking about our character being shaped, being molded, being filled out, so to speak. And uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament, perfect uh, refers to that sense of maturity, of completeness, of growth. And the trials that give us endurance, they make us tougher, but not just tough for the sake of tough, but that we would be better, that we would be formed and shaped to be the kind of person that God calls us to be, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I think the analogy of, of wellness, physical wellness, uh, works really well here. I, I can't help but think of something like long distance running when I hear the word endurance and see that idea in the Bible. You know that for our physical wellness, we, we uh, inflict a lot of pain on ourselves. We put ourselves through hardships 
uh, in terms of maybe working out or running, the pain that is experienced by that, the soreness, uh, or even the restrictions of a diet or otherwise, that we're, we're hard on ourselves. But are we just doing that uh, because we like pain? You know, we're like those people that, you know, just like whack themselves with huge boards just for, the, for showing off how much pain they can tolerate. No, we put ourselves through pain physically in exercise or diet or working out uh, for the wellness of our body, for the wholeness of our body is what we're trying to achieve. And again, the testing of our faith, the, the, the trying time that we may be experiencing right now, uh, can have uh, this same effect. Let me maybe mention a few examples. Um, right now, I, I will suggest that I think you're exercising a muscle that was unfamiliar to you or maybe less used um, just a few months ago. Um, the idea of worshiping remotely and uh, being in your own home in front of a screen or listening to the worship taking place um, I will say from my own limited experience, when I've had to do that, it, it is not easy. Uh, it, it takes the exercising of a certain brain muscle to stay focused, to stay locked in on what's going on. There's more distractions around you. It's very easy to, you know, just, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to stand up and start sweeping the kitchen, you know, and I have everything on, or I'm going to start, uh, well, I'll, I'll just look on Facebook real quick on my phone while the worship's going on, or, oh, you know, the, the dog needs to be taken out, or, you know, the... It's harder in some ways to worship in this kind of environment that you may be worshiping in uh, right now. It's a muscle we're exercising. And again, it's hard, but if we'll apply ourselves, that can be something that can strengthen us. And maybe even when life goes completely back to normal, if that ever happens, we've built up a muscle that we can then use for our own benefit, to listen to sermons more regularly, and to, to engage with all the different tools that we have thanks to technology for edification and learning. Uh, maybe another example, uh, something like finances. If, if this has been, or if, if we experienced at any point a financial crisis, uh, you, we understand that we have to tighten our belt when that happens, right? It's harder. The budget gets uh, much more limited. And so we have to make some hard decisions, perhaps, about how we're spending our money. And it could be that in that moment we realize, you know what, I've been spending my money on things that just really aren't uh, uh, needed. They're not necessary, and maybe even they're a waste of money, a waste of time. And so in a financial hardship, we, we uh, you know, that endurance sets in, that toughness sets in to where we make sacrifices to cut things out. But I think what God would desire for us is that that would be a learning moment, a maturing moment, to where then if things do ease up or go back to normal, we're still intentional and thoughtful about, you know what, as Steve mentioned earlier, I'm a steward of what I've been given. And that difficult moment taught me to get my priorities in order. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the money that I have for the things that are the most important in the eyes of God. To do His work, as we have mentioned earlier. There's other things that we could say about this. We may be hurting from a loss of, 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 of relationship physical relationship that we get to enjoy with our brothers and sisters or other things. And so we're exercising other ways to keep in touch or to reach out. Let's do that. Let's keep exercising those means and, and, and make that into a regular habit of ours to reach out, to engage, even if it is virtually and not ideal over the phone or, or through Zoom uh, or otherwise. Uh, let's exercise those muscles and add that uh, to our life to, to um, add the things that are lacking, as James says in chapter 1, verse 4, or with prayer or Bible reading or any of these things. Um, uh, the, the, the difficult moment we're experiencing, again, if we will let it, can be a workout for us, that we can develop habits and disciplines and fill up our life in a way that maybe we were lacking before all of this started. This is almost exactly uh, what is said in Romans chapter 5. In fact, look at this chart here, and I'll read you what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 3. He says, not only this, we also exult, that is rejoice, in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Hope that does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This, this uh, chain is exactly what Paul describes, that tribulation uh, produces 
perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope, which we'll get to in just a second. And because of all of that, we can rejoice even in our trials. Well, this is not easy, of course. And one of the things that it requires from us is wisdom. There's a lot of things to think through and to figure out uh, and to navigate in all of this. And so we need wisdom. And James seems to uh, identify that in verse 5 when he says, If you lack wisdom, then ask God. We'll come back to that verse in just a moment. But notice in chapter 3, right in the middle of the book of James, that uh, James says some things here about wisdom that I think are important to have in our minds before we then discuss uh, what he said in chapter 1 about wisdom. In chapter 3, verse 13, James says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There is a lot of uh, wisdom that is being thrown around these days by all sorts of people. Uh, Politicians, podcasters. um, I had another P word that fit well in that tree. I just thought of it like a few minutes ago, and now I've forgotten it. Um, But, uh, man, what was it? Professors, that's what it was. Professors, politicians, and podcasters. Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of people uh, everywhere we look right now, maybe especially right now, that are saying this is wisdom. This is uh, what is true. This is what people need to be thinking. This is what people need to be saying. This is what people need to be doing. But James makes clear in this beautiful paragraph in chapter 3 that uh, not all wisdom is created equal. Not all wisdom is the same. Uh, that there is an earthly wisdom that he says is not just not heavenly. He says it's demonic of all things. Pretty strong language. But he describes this wisdom as uh, selfish. Wisdom that says, what is best for me? What is going to benefit me? What's going to get me ahead? And it doesn't think about the Lord. It doesn't think about others. And unfortunately, much of what we hear uh, from other sources Um, is this kind of wisdom? What's going to be good for me? What's going to benefit me? But James says the wisdom from above is from the Lord. And so he says in chapter 1, verse 5, that we need to pray for it. So there's several things going on here. One is recognizing uh, the source of true wisdom, which is God. So we pray to him for it. But then if we recognize what true wisdom is, that's going to affect what we pray for. Um, and maybe we should think about that. What, ha- what have we been praying for? I, I, I'm, I'm almost certain that for many of us, maybe prayer has been more regular for us or generally is more regular for us in trying times. But what have we been praying for? Have our prayers really been focused on me and what's good for me? Um, not that it's wrong to pray these things, but, but is the totality of our prayer these days keep me safe, keep me healthy? Uh, uh, help me not to lose my job. Help me to remain comfortable. Um, what are we praying for? Are we praying for that wisdom from above that would complete our character, that would fill us up? That, that's the connection we don't want to miss between verses 4 and 5 of James chapter 1. That verse 4 is clearly talking about character formation, that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then verse 5 says, but if you lack wisdom, ask God. Verse 5 of James 1 is not just saying, well, you know, whatever you want, you know, you want a new car, you want to just pray for it, God will give it to you if you believe hard enough. We're in the conversation here about character formation. And if you, like me, recognize the, 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 the great need for character improvement, ask God to help us and our families to be more, as we said earlier, holy, joyful, thankful, prayerful, and more uh, active in doing good. Let's pray for God's wisdom. But then, of course, he goes on to say that it's not just praying 
to God. It's not just praying for the right things, praying for true wisdom, but it's praying with faith, with trust, with commitment to him and not wavering, not doubting. That paragraph in chapter three mentioned that the, the, the wisdom from above is unwavering and it is not hypocritical. Uh, we mentioned this, and so we, we won't go on and on about it. In our class, uh, uh, talking about Zedekiah in the book of Jeremiah on Wednesday, I, I quoted this passage here. But unfortunately, uh, it's a picture of us, Zedekiah is, too often. That we say the right things, we might even pray for the right things, but when it comes down to it, we just, we don't commit ourselves. Right? And so we pray to God that he would uh, deliver us from temptation. And yet when the temptation arises, it, it's just, we just want it too much. And, and we don't commit ourselves to, to taking the out, perhaps, that God gives us or resisting in the way God would have us to. Or perhaps we pray to God that, that he would uh, uh, help us to develop the habits that we, that we need in our daily life. And yet when it comes down to it, it's just a lot easier to get on my phone and, and look at social media than it is to get my Bible out and read it. You see, there's a follow-up here that, that praying to God for true wisdom has to be coupled with, has to go along with the commitment, the faith, to believe, to trust in God's power to transform us, and then to act on that trust by obeying Him. And if we don't, we, we wind up in a miserable situation. As he says here, tossed to and fro. I, I think we can say we've been there, that double-mindedness. I know I've been there where we say we want to do right, but we're not committed to it. And that just, that, that destroys us because then we're battling with our conscience and with guilt and, and, and we're back and forth, in and out. So James says, pray for true wisdom and then trust God, commit to him, receive it with, uh, without hypocrisy, pure uh, heavenly wisdom that can change us and that can perfect our character to, to make us who God wants us to be. One of the things I think that makes, us, that, makes that difficult for us is that, that it is, is so easy in this world to be short-sighted, to look at the things of this life. And those things uh, capture so much of our attention that it's hard to look past them to the things that are heavenly and that are eternal. And maybe that's why. I understand James is a little bit— uh, sometimes people call James the New Testament version of Proverbs— and one of the characteristics of James that's like Proverbs that kind of jumps from thing to thing. And so I'm, I'm not going to claim that all of these have some brilliant logic, uh, you know, from one thing to the next. But it is interesting that in this context, James takes a couple verses to talk about the perspective that is needed, particularly in regards to wealth and to money, which is a big deal for James in his letter. But as we're going through trials, I think the, the truth of James 1, 9 to 11 is maybe clearer than it is at other times. What James says here is that uh, wealth is fleeting. It's temporary. And the pursuit of wealth is futile. The chase for more cash, more money, uh, more material possessions. All that, he says, is uh, looks nice like a flower, but like on these 100 degree days in Houston, uh, they are zapped up very quickly. Um, they're temporary. And so if you're poor, you, there's a certain confidence you can have in the things of this world uh, are not everything they're cracked up to be, and they're not what we will be judged on uh, or what will be the basis of our, of our eternal life. And if we're rich, which as Steve said earlier, we're all very abundantly blessed, especially in this time and place, uh, there's a sobering uh, notion of all this stuff that I have, uh, the, you know, the, the house and the garage and the storage unit full of things and the bank account full of money, that doesn't do me one iota of good in, in the eternal scheme of things. And so there's some perspective that's necessary. And again, I, I think when we have to tighten the belt a little bit, whether it's financially or just to, when we see things uh, uh, maybe beginning to unravel in our society, it should be a reminder, oh yeah, these, these things of this world are not going to last forever. And so they give us a helpful perspective uh, in that way. And when we have perspective about the temporary nature of, of this, uh, this age, then we can't help but then look 
to what's coming afterward. And so James says in chapter 1, verse 12, that blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Um, as Paul included in Romans chapter 5, hope is essential to the endurance of trials and the, the maintaining of joy and blessedness in the midst of hardship. The hope that we have. And you could say on one hand that, 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 that this hope stands alone, right? That, that kind of regardless of all these other things we've been talking about, just knowing there's a light at the end of the tunnel, just knowing that, that, that we are waiting for Jesus to return and to make everything right and to save us from this crooked and perverse generation, just knowing that, that hope uh, can lighten us a little bit and, and give us some of that joy that we're looking for. But James 1 verse 12, I don't think stands alone from the rest of this conversation. In fact, this verse seems to be the completion of what he's been describing earlier. Notice the language of verse uh, 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Okay, so the man that he's talking about, the hope that he's describing in verse 12 is for the one that has made it through this difficult process. And once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Once he has been approved. That's the same word, approved, is the same root of the word earlier about the testing of your faith. Verse 12 is describing the person that has had their faith tested, and they come out on the other side approved. They will receive the crown of life. Not explicit here, but you may remember that crowns, wreaths, were given in ancient times in the, in the Olympic Games to those who won the races, who, who, who won those competitions. That was their reward. Again, you may remember the words of Paul in 2 Timothy. Fought the good fight and finished the race. There was laid up for me a crown of righteousness. James says here that when you are tested through the hardships of this life and you are approved, you, you, you hold fast, and that trial has its proper effect to shape us into the people that God wants us to be, and we hold on to him in trust and in faith, we'll receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Not promised to anyone who just makes it, lives and dies. No, promised to those who love him and live their life out of love and trust in the Lord. So we are waiting in hope, but it is an active waiting. That we are, uh, we are not just uh, uh, tolerating the trials, but the trials are testing us and we are working through them to become the people, and maybe we should say allow God to shape us into the people that he wants us to be. But in the end, it does, I will admit, um, especially right now, um, when time seems to stand still and, and even next week seems uncertain. Sometimes we need, and we need, I think right now, just some good old-fashioned patience. And that's exactly what James will say later in his book. Toward the conclusion of the book of James in chapter 5, he says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. The illustration to me of the farmer has always just been uh, perfect. Think about it. Does anybody work harder than a farmer? Does anybody in the world work harder than a farmer? Uh, getting up early every day, the field doesn't have weekends, no days off, working from sunup till sundown, hard manual labor that also involves a lot of knowledge uh, about science and weather and all those kinds of things. Does anybody work harder than a farmer? But does anybody have to wait more and, and, and be more patient than a farmer? Uh, waiting for the seasons to change, waiting for all the work you've done in to, to pay off at some point. It hasn't rained in a while, but it's going to rain at some point. I just got to keep waiting. Those crops are going to come at some point. And this just seems to be the perfect illustration for us, that we are to be farmers working hard every day, not taking days off from sunup till sundown, applying ourselves to be stronger, to be knowledgeable, to be better. 
But to have that patience to wait, knowing that we may not see the effects of what we're doing right now, but we're waiting for the harvest. We're waiting for the Lord to come back. And it's near. I wish I could say it's, it's going to be next week. It's going to be this year. Maybe 2020, God will, will be merciful enough to not even let it go to its conclusion. Jesus will come back before all of that, and everything will be right. But whenever it is, whether it's in our lifetime or not, we're waiting for it. And we have to be patient. But that hope and the active waiting in hope is what uh, God desires will, will shape us and form us uh, through the trial uh, to the end goal to make us who he wants us to be. Holy, joyful, prayerful, thankful, and active in doing good. That is God's will for us during uh, this, again, rather strange year of 2020. As we said before, um, we are here uh, for anybody, to ha for anybody that needs help, anybody that needs, uh, has a spiritual need to learn, to grow, to have prayer, uh, please let us know. Uh, typically, we would love to all be here in person, put our arms around you, and to pray for you, um, but it, please reach out to us. Call us, contact us. Um, if you want to learn more, if you, or if you need to take that step to be baptized into Christ, and to begin this journey in a covenant with Jesus, please reach out to us. But for now, we're going to end with a prayer, uh, and then in just a few minutes, start our uh, Bible study that we have every Sunday and Wednesday on the book of Jeremiah. Will you pray with me as we close our worship service? God in heaven, you know all, you see all. We are uh, so small and so ignorant, uh, relative to, to your unlimited power and unlimited knowledge. And so, Father, we ask for your forgiveness when we go beyond uh, what is our, uh, our proper bounds and we presume to know more than we do. And we ask for your forgiveness when we go beyond uh, your commands and we live life on our own terms and don't submit to your wisdom. And look, for our, look out for ourselves and not for you or for others. Father, we, we ask for your forgiveness when we are lacking in faith during difficult times. And we pray that right now you would uh, strengthen us. That you would mold us and shape us uh, to be transformed into your image. Into the image of your son, Jesus, who gave himself as our sacrifice uh, to fulfill the requirement that we were not able to fulfill. Help us to grow as individuals, as families, and as a congregation through all of this. We pray that our commitment would be steadfast and increasing every day. And we do pray for those that are hurting, uh, those uh, who are experiencing difficulty uh, at this moment, for the Mercer family that was mentioned earlier, for the Hill family, for the Tom family, uh, for the Nickersons, uh, for uh, Irma Stark's family, and for others that we have been uh, uh, paying attention to and, and, and uh, praying for both of our number and those uh, that we know and love that are connected to our congregation. Um, help us not uh, just to pray for these people, but to, uh, to rally in love and uh, mercy to those uh, who we can serve in some way. And we pray now that as we enter into our Bible study that you would bless our investigation of your word uh, to grow in knowledge, but to grow in grace and uh, zeal as well. And we pray in all things that we do as a congregation and as individuals that we would bring glory and honor to the name of your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.